Good morning, everyone. assignments due on Tuesdays so that you can come in, ask questions, and finish it up by that night. Uh, the homework and the quiz were originally, the machine set them to be due this Sunday night, which is not what I wanted to do, so I have since changed it to Tuesday, the minute before midnight. So, and general operating procedure, you will have the weekend to work on it, you can ask questions on the Tuesday, assignments, but again, uh, th those are just there so that they're, they can begin looking at them if you want to. Yes. I don't know how to look on my website to see if I did pay the months or if it's giving me that like two week or, you know, and I try to look through like the, like your orders and like that kind of thing and I just, I, I'm not certain off the top of my head either because I have not been in customer of a sign in a while. Because, um, like, I, I mean, I bought it last semester, but I don't know if I bought it for, like, the whole year or if I bought it for, like, the semester. Like, that's why I'm trying to... Right. Um, I'm under the impression, from what I've been told from other students, that one, usually it'll be yelling at you with a countdown if you have, if you're under, like, the two-week period. Mm -hmm. So if you're not seeing that, okay. you should be okay. That said, I've had students who were using the two-week period. That ended. They then got normal service, and they were still in the class. All their grades were still there. So if for some reason that is the case, once you get the access again, you should be okay. Okay. should say, like, So, uh, today we're going to be probably closing out chapter 10. Uh, so we'll be starting chapter 11 this week to get into the flow of about a chapter a week most of the semester. Um, if you have any questions at any time, be they about the course, the material, or any stray scientific or goofy thought that crosses into your head, please do not hesitate to 
task. Uh, to begin with today, we're going to start off cold with a uh, thermal expansion question. So, as stated, uh, thermal expansion is especially an issue in construction because usually architects have to do very precise math to get the building exactly the shape and rigid rigidity that they need, and then something expands and the whole thing falls down. So, good architects take this into account. This bridge was built by bad architects, as you will soon find out. Um, this particular bridge is a solid slab of steel, which to start with is not recommended to begin with. Uh, this particular slab of steel is an improbable 250 meters across. We do have bridges that long. They are just a little uncommon in this part of the world. Erasers are an endangered species on this floor. As soon as I cultivate a collection of them and try to uh, get more of them, they vanish as soon as they're being poached. Okay. So, let's start listing what we know. This bridge was originally 250 meters of solid steel on a 45 degree Fahrenheit day. So that's going to give us length initial, 250 meters. Temperature initial, 45 degrees Fahrenheit. However, 45 degrees is a brisk winter's day in this part of the world, whereas in the summer, things will heat up to approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit. What will the bridges and what will the sorry, I put down the wrong thing. How much longer will the bridge be on that hot summer day than it was when it was installed? So this is everything the problem originally tells us, everything that it asks of us. Pictures there. Good tip in general if the problem doesn't already have a picture, feel free to draw one. Sometimes you need to to be able to do some of the geometry in your head, and sometimes it's just helpful. Like physically doing anything with the blank sheet, putting down anything, even if it's a sketch of the situation, does get the process started. Now, in this particular case, we have thermal, a thermal expansion question. So what should our first, well, where should we look from here? Sure okay, so we know this bridge is expanding, so let's take a look at our expansion equations. We have one for length and one for volume, which one's more appropriate here. Very good. So we're just going to copy in that length formula. It's got delta L, which is what we want, so that's very good. Delta L over origin, look. Delta L over original L. You know this. You want this. Very good. Set equal to alpha times delta T. solid steel, so if the question tells you what something is made of, that's usually an invitation to consult one of those tables. So we want the alpha of steel specifically. Uh, tap back a couple slides, look at our table. Alpha is coefficient of linear expansion, so we look down this list, here's the steel, and that's 11 times 10 to the negative 6 inverse degrees Celsius. Temperatures in Fahrenheit, <laughs> like both of them, does that mean we can keep them or do we have to get the Celsius first? 
Good question. Correct. Your units do have to match, but none of our metric formulas can take care of it. So both of these need to change to something, but as long as they are both Celsius or both Kelvin, it'll be fine. That is a very good observation. We now have our alpha. We want delta L. We know L initial. Last detail to be able to plug in and start solving is those temperatures. So we need to adjust Ti and Tf into the Celsius or Kelvin scale. Because this question has a delta T in it, either will work here. If it's a delta T, Celsius is legal because the change in temperature for Celsius is the same as the temperature of the as the same is the same as the change in temperature in Kelvin. And the, that's a sign that I need some water. If you guys can work out those temperature conversions, that would be lovely. Okay, so what are the Celsius temperatures? Seven point two three. Good. And then thirty seven point seven eight. Excellent. Um brief math reminder. It's been a minute since you guys have seen this. Uh, when you've worked these on your calculators, it probably told you 7.2 and 3.7 point, sorry, 37.7. In general, I'm usually fine rounding to the tenths, it's our to the hundredths place when you're just writing things down. But does anyone recognize the mathematical shorthand of putting a line over a specific digit? All right, so that indicates that whatever you've overlined continues. So if you wanted to be as accurate as possible and include the set, like the infinite chain of sevens, you can write that line over this seven, and the implication is that if the sevens go on forever, you just round into that 58 lines. Place. So, we now have everything we need to go ahead and plug in here. So let's go ahead. We want delta L, our original L is 250 meters. That's equal to our alpha times delta T, which is always final minus initial. We went to the hot temperature from cold temperature. My eights are especially strong. Fives aren't too hot either. And all that's left is a little bit of algebra. And we have our delta L. Very good. Just going to triple check that myself. That is 
That's what I remember it being. Yes. So, when solving for delta L, that's going to be 0 0.084 meters approximately. So this whole bridge, when increasing in temperature by about 55 Celsius uh, Fahrenheit, only increases in length by eight and a half centimeters. Not something you would visually notice unless you were looking for it. So before we do anything else, does this seem like a problem? If you were in the construction industry, would you assume this would be a problem? Meters? Yes. Well, what is what, what is this in seven? That is still a rather tiny amount of distance. The, it might be, depending on how it is built. If the engineers did their job right and accounted for that little bit of expansion, things will probably be fine. But let's say, let's just imagine a worst case scenario where the bridge is going to get longer, but there's no room for it to expand. It also doesn't have any room to bend, so let's just assume it just shifts upwards slightly. In that type of a situation, how bad would it get for the bridge this long? If we were to draw the triangle created here, this is not to scale, by the way. This is not to scale. The gap is still 250 meters long, and the road bed itself is now only slightly longer. If the bridge did do this, how much higher up would it jut on one side? The, most bridges are designed not to do this, but we're assuming that whoever's in charge of this is completely Now, what does this look like you experienced before? Pythagorean. Very good. So, good old Pythagoras tells us a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, c is always the hypotenuse, so we're going to call that a, call that b. So, 250 squared plus b squared equals 200, 250.084 squared. So hypothetical worst case scenario, how much higher up would one end of this bridge end up? Okay, almost, I think. So that sounds like B squared to me. Did you take the square root yet? Yeah. Say, okay, that's just the last step is taking that square root. After you take the square root, what do you get? 6.48. Very good. Now, Again, even I've been doing physics for a long time, and even then, still, I have to sometimes convert meters to feet just to get a sense of scale in my head. If one meter is about 3.3 feet, that means that this jump upwards on one side is about 22 feet. That's a two-story building. Now, again, you shouldn't be building bridges that are 250 meters of straight steel slab across. You also should be accounting for this thermal expansion. So 
I pray that there isn't a bridge on this planet that does this. I highly doubt this could actually happen because you usually assume the bed would start bending first. Yeah, why? Why did that happen? To prove how ridiculous this would be if it did happen. And to prove that it is just, it is important to take it into account. You either have to assume, allow room for it to grow, or you have to allow your bridge room to flex. And the flexing is the more scary option because 250 meters of steel bending up and down every season, I assume that would break pretty quickly. So again, this is a hyperbolic situation, but I like it to demonstrate why this needs to be taken into account. Questions? Anything at all? thing I'd like to discuss within the confines of chapter 10. Uh, last couple of examples we've been doing are all about the expansion of solid or possibly even liquid objects. But everything expands based on its temperature. And this is actually most noticeable with gases. I've mentioned Across both of my lectures, I've, I've mentioned that like, you can leave a soccer ball or a beach ball out overnight and find it deflated in the morning. The temperature changes overnight. As the temperature of the gas inside gets lower, the gas contracts and starts to occupy a smaller volume, so the ball shrinks. And if you've had chemistry courses, you probably had to deal with the kinetic theory of gases before because this comes up a lot in chemistry. Uh, functionally, it's just the principle of thermal expansion as applied to a gas. And there's a, just a couple more details that one needs to take into account when doing so. Uh, when a gas expands, gases are unique in that they are, if you have a gas inside a container, it's constantly exerting pressure on that container because the gas particles are always bouncing around inside off of each other and off of whatever they are contained in. When you inflate a balloon, as you put gas into that balloon, one eraser, where is it? Need more. Thank you. Pull the drum balloon. Build lots of air molecules. They're bouncing around all over the place, off of each other, but also against their container. And so, the higher the temperature of these particles, the farther apart the particles are going to get, the more they're colliding with each other, the more they're colliding with the wall of the balloon. That increases the amount of force that the balloon experiences every single second. And that force over the balloon's entire surface area creates pressure. Yes? Wait, so does that mean a, a balloon deflates because it was placed in a lower temperature than it was before? That is one of the things that can cause a balloon to shrink. But notice, if you leave like a helium balloon floating in your room, eventually it starts sinking. That's probably because the helium is slowly moving out. So the fact, okay, and you're, you sort of hit on a very good example here. Things that affect volume of balloon. Temperature, yes, if you make it colder, it will shrink by the general rule. But additionally, you have pressure. 
if you put pretty much anything in a higher pressure environment, if there's more pressure pressing into something, it's going to shrink. It might actually. I wish I had the actual device to be able to do this, but the bigger it gets. And eventually, as the air leaks back out, it's just going to get smaller, even if the temperature is the same. So those three things need to be taken into account when examining the gas inside of a system. And this is a thing that I wish I had the jar to do with you today. I think eventually I'll be able to break up and expand. So what they're going to do is, you know, people made of marshmallows and put inside of a vacuum jar, and they're going to pump all the air out. Apparently we're all under an amount of air pressure that's pressing into our bodies. When you pump out the air, there is less pressure pushing in, which means the object is able to expand. Conversely, if you put the pressure back and it's crushed. Wait, so they took air out? Yes. So they decreased the pressure inside? They, they decreased the pressure acting inwards on the marshmallows. Sorry, say again. They inflated when they took it out? Right. I need to draw a better picture than just that bullet. One second. Where did I Thank you. I was hiding behind this chair. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. I really should. Thank you. It's a wonderful idea, and I appreciate it. just balloons has some amount of pressure squeezing into it from the outside because we live in a planet with air and atmosphere. The air is constantly pushing, pushing into your body. Subsequently, due to Newton's second law, it's third law, I'm sorry, your body has to press outwards to counteract that pressure. But if you go to a place where the pressure is different, let's say you reduce the air pressure around you, and now the air pressure inside pushing out is bigger than the pressure outside pushing in, then the pressure inside pressing out will physically cause the balloon to expand until the pressure is and marshmallows do this because they're mostly air. They're just air and sugar. So when you remove the pressure outside of the marshmallow, the pressure inside the marshmallow pushing out literally pushes the marshmallow outwards until the pressure is normalized. But then when you bring all the air back in all at once, it's just going to crush it because now the pressure outside in is bigger than the pressure inside out. So of the 
three most common states of matter, solid, liquid, gas. Gases are the ones that have the most going on. There's the most things affecting their state at any given moment. Solids, you heat it up, you cool it down, it'll expand, contract a little bit, it's not gonna change a whole lot. Liquids, they have solid, they, Liquids have definite volume, but they don't have definite shape. So they'll take the shape of their container, they'll flow, they will expand and contract with thermal energy. But gases uniquely expand, contract the most, and can take the shape of their container. They have no definite shape, they have no definite volume. This makes them the most complex of the three states of matter commonly seen on planet Earth, which is why we have physicists and chemists studying their unique behavior. And all of the factors affecting the volume of a gas, not just the temperature, are summarized in this statement, which you might have seen before in previous chemistry courses. Raise your hand if this looks familiar. Okay, that was every hand. So this, I don't have to ask if it doesn't look familiar to anyone. My high school chem teacher, bless her heart, would call this pervnert, which helped it stick in my brain. But other teachers just call it pervnert. And it, can, it contains within it all three of these things affecting, at any given moment, the volume of the gas. P is the pressure acting on the container. Subsequently, it's also the pressure the gas itself is exerting. V is the volume. N is the number of moles of gas present. Well, have, has anyone in here not dealt with moles as a unit for mass yet? Okay, so it's not. That's not alien to anyone? Okay, very good. So, just a measure of the amount of gas present. R is a constant, Avogadro's number, recorded right here for you. And then T is the temperature. All these factors combined affect the state of a gas, not just its specific temperature. Yes? In physics, will we ever use R when it's like the decimal number and not? The 8.31. I think it's in chemicals when they do a decimal number, right? You use the decimal when it's in. Okay, so like for pressure, are we always going to be given it in Pascals? Because yes, I prefer to use Pascals. Because when you use 8.31 in Pascals, but when you use like a decimal, like I think like 0.852, it's when you use atmosphere. So I don't know if you use atmosphere or. Oh, good question. I thought it was 0.0829. Oh, it's something like that. I think that's what we're doing. We're just doing it today. Yeah, I'm sorry. I love the atmosphere. On my homework, you do use 8.31 for the one that's got a bunch of stuff, because I looked it up. It just because that was a short. But I'm just curious if we were going to use the other number. Okay. Pressure and Pascal. Yeah, you use 8.31 because it's like a direct conversion, or like a direct proportional. Okay. You're all asking very good questions. And I appreciate, thank you all for that because I didn't know there was a discrepancy on homework. I'm just taking me a second to process all the individual parts of information. So just a second, sorry. Okay, what I'm going to do is the 8.31 is the value recommended for Pascals. Yes, yes it is. So, what I'm going to do is just briefly write what each of these things are. R is called the gas constant. This value, 8.31 joules per mole per Kelvin, is the value used if pressure is in Pascals. There's 
a different value for you are using atmospheres. If Pascal is in atmospheres, then you're going to want to use 0 0.0821 liters per atmosphere per mole per calorie. Thank you. Because I do know that sometimes the different ones are going to pop up. Why is my L? So, as a reminder, there are two common units of pressure. There's actually several units of pressure. There's just two of which that are used most frequently in metric science. Uh, one of which is Pascal's, the other is atmospheres. Atmosphere is designed as the, air, the amount of air pressure you are currently feeling. It's literally measured to be one atmosphere is sea level, average day, average temperature. Meanwhile, I'm not actually certain what the base unit for Pascal's is. I just know the conversion. One atmosphere is 101,325 Pascal's. So there's different units. You are currently under one atmosphere of air pressure. Alternatively, that's 101,325 Pascal's of air pressure. So pressure will either be in Pascal's or atmospheres. That's the only difference is going, the only difference in what you will do there is which gas constant you plug in. Your options are either use this to convert one to the other or pick your gas constant accordingly. We also have volume. Both of these gas constants, I think are supposed to take liters for your volume. Moles of 
there. At 25 degrees Celsius. I did just say that we're going to need Kelvin. So, very good. And people with the volume. 1.5 liters. Therefore, what is the pressure currently on this system? Yes, we do also know R. Thank you. sign will be picky because its answer boxes always say what it's expecting. I'm not picky this was, if this was say a test or a lab assignment. As long as the answer is correct for the unit you write down, it should, it'll be fine. And I actually want to use, I want to use atmospheres here because I think that it'll be easier to compare that to the one atmosphere you're currently experiencing. So let's use the constant for atmospheres. So that's about, it's over 12 times what you're experiencing right now, so this probably is not a standard bullet. possible to get the inverse equivalent of the bends if you go into a no pressure environment and then come back to a normal one because then your nitrogen bubbles would expand to a large amount and then contract very quickly. Would you swell? Yes, actually. Um, in sci-fi, sci it's not a pretty picture, but have you at least 
heard of the idea that if a person goes into a vacuum of space without a suit on, they'll explode. The reason for that is, on Earth, there's pressure pushing into your body from the air. And to counter that pressure, our bodies are designed to exert a certain amount of pressure back out. That amount of pressure is within a certain window to account for pretty much anything we'll experience on planet Earth. The pressure that our body exerts outwards is able to adjust based on you know, what you experience up the top of the mountain or as far down on the sea floor as one can reasonably go. So on Earth, that pressure scales correctly. The problem is if you go into the vacuum of space where there's no air pressure acting on your body. Because if you go from air pressure to nothing, your body does not have time to adjust to that change and we're not built to deal with a non-pressure environment. So the pressure inside of your body pushing out doesn't go away because it's based on like your blood pumping around. Which means that now your body is just pressing outwards against nothing and it'll keep pressing outwards until you're not a person. Does that affect your mass? Like no. Your mass so like if I weigh myself on top of a mountain and then weigh myself in a submarine, like am I going to be... Your mass will be the same. Like the amount of matter inside your body will be the same. It's like if you went to the moon. Like the, the number of protons and such in you remains unchanged. Your weight might change because Buoyancy, buoyant forces depends on the density of the fluid. So on top of a mountain, you might, well, there's a lot of factors affecting what one weighs on a mountain. You get further away from Earth's core, meaning they're lighter, but the air is thinner, so there's less buoyant force, which makes you heavier. So it's a mixed bag. But your mass would remain the same. Weight might change, mass won't. Okay, last thing we'll do today. I'm just going to take the same problem and make it a, we're going to change a few variables around. Because sometimes in nature, more than one thing affecting a gas happens at once. Because if you leave a balloon outside, it'll probably get colder overnight, but the pressure system might change, the weather might change, so the pressure affecting the ball might shift at the same time as the temperature change, which can cause some weird effects depending on how much one changes versus the other. So what one can do is Thank you. So there's two ways we can go about it. We could rework this with the new variables and compare our answers. We could also look at this version of the formula. This assumes constant moles of gas, which most experiments will assume most of the time. But as long as everything is changing, as long as pressure, volume, and temperature are all changing, you can take that into account in the formulas this version should also still work if you just care about the change. But, really quickly, let's say volume is reduced by 0.25. Don't erase what you have and just save it more in space. And more temperature is increased by 5. It's three. So pressure of 1 is that. Two new numbers. Fifteen, you said? Fourteen. 
So, we reduced the volume and increased the temperature. In general, those are both things that will make pressure go up. So both things made the, both factors would normally make the pressure increase by themselves. So combined, made the pressure increase. Wait, you were using that, you said what, and what happened? Decreasing volume will make pressure go up because the gas now is forced into a smaller space and they're bouncing around off of each other even more. And at the same time, increasing temperature makes pressure go up. The particles are now bouncing around more and more. So these are all the different things that can, that can affect um, the volume of a gas specifically. For solids and liquids, it's mostly just going to be thermal expansion. Gases are kind of a weird one here. So it's just, just talk about all the different things that go into it for those. Yes? Yeah. So like, what's the temperature being higher means that the particles themselves are more excited and more prone to be able to escape. To leak through whatever like opening there is. Oh, okay. Yeah, slowly leaking back out through yeah. the original uh, opening. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. <laughs> 